Hey guys, Brian Schultz here with Cave Falcon Kayak, and in this video, I'm gonna give you an informal demonstration on how to steam bend the ribs into one of my skin on frame canoes. This is going to be similar, but not identical to the type of instructional content that we offer in our online skin on frame canoe building course. I'm gonna talk about what I'm doing while I'm doing it as I rib this boat. And I'm also just gonna chat a little bit about whatever I feel like talking about at the moment. So even though this isn't an official instructional video, if you're interested in small boat building, and especially if you're interested in steam bending, I think you're gonna pick up a lot of interesting tips here. And if you wanna go deeper, you can always check out our actual online skin on frame boat building courses. So here's all the ribs that I cut to length yesterday using our formula. These are all labeled at one end. And then before we start steaming, I'm just gonna lay all these on the floor in order and I'm gonna get a straight edge and I'm gonna push it up against one edge of the ribs. And the reason I'm doing this right now is just to act as a quick sandy check on my measuring system because if there's any errors in the measuring system, I'm gonna see a weird spot in this parabolic curve right here. And if I do, that lets me know that I need to stop, I need to go back to my math and see if I can figure out what's going on with that particular rib. On the other hand, if it just looks nice and smooth like this, that lets me know that this is probably good and we can go on to steaming. Now, just a quick word on the wood that I'm using for this build. In this case, I'm using white oak. Anytime you're doing steam bending, and especially if you're free bending like I'm doing here today, you really need to be using green wood or at the very worst, air dried wood. If you try to do this with kiln dried wood, it will not work. Some other types of woodworking, you can get away with that. This type of woodworking, you're not going to. So taking a look at the steam box, my steaming setup here is pretty basic. I've just got a cheap plywood box. This is just two pieces of CDX spread apart by some one by twos. I've got a little block in the front to partially block the steam. And then on the inside, I've got a couple of dowels going across. And these dowels are in there loosely. That way at the end of the build, if I need to adjust the shape on any of the ribs, I can just pull the dowels out quickly and I can slide entire ribs sideways into this box to do a little bit of reshaping. I've got a towel over the top here that helps to keep some of the heat in and also blocks this opening while I'm between ribs. And then on top, I've got a couple of these gloves. I really like this particular type of glove for steam bending. I find that heavy leather gloves just don't give me the dexterity I need. And then for the ribs and the ends, it's important to back those so you don't split out those steep bends. So I've just got a chunk of an old belt. Now, feeding this steam box down here, I have a wallpaper steamer and that's plugged into the wall and I've also got a backup kettle in the other room so if this runs down on water I can run in there really quickly turn on the kettle and I can replace the boiling water with more boiling water because if you pour cold water into this it's going to interrupt the steaming cycle and basically you're going to lose the ribs that are stacked up in the steam box at that point so this is just going through the hose into a hole in the back of the box when I'm re-steaming ribs, I actually move that hose to the center of the box because it will steam those a little bit better. So according to yesterday's test, these ribs were bending really well at about six minutes. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a rib in and then I'm gonna wait a minute and a half and I'm gonna put another rib in. I'm gonna wait another minute and a half and put another rib in. And then finally, I'm gonna wait another minute and a half and put another rib in. And then by the time I get to that six minute mark, I will have four ribs stacked across here and the first one will have steamed for six minutes, which means that all I've got to do for my subsequent ribs is put a rib in and then pull a rib out at that one and a half minute interval. And that lets me steam a rib every minute and a half as opposed to having to put one in, waiting six minutes, taking it out and putting another one in. And the important thing here is to make sure that your interval time both matches the appropriate steaming time for that rib and also matches your working pace, which is why it's so important to do those tests the day before so you can learn those things so you don't end up getting stressed out during your actual build. Now, keep in mind, that six minutes just has to do with this particular rib thickness and this particular stick of wood. If you try to apply arbitrary rules like that across different sticks of wood and different thicknesses, you're gonna run into a lot of problems. And the most problem I frequently see is people actually overcooking their ribs because they think that the longer you steam it for, the longer it's gonna be pliable. But the reality is, the longer that you steam a piece of wood for, once it gets to its optimal steaming time, the more brittle it becomes and the more likely it is to break. And then people get into this vicious cycle where they start steaming for longer and longer trying to solve that problem and things get worse and they get frustrated. 
So I'm going to put this in and then I'm going to put on my gloves and we're going to get ready to bend. All right, I'm up on my six minutes or something close to that. I'm going to put a rib in and I'm going to pull this first rib out with the belt behind it as I go. I'm going to back it with the belt. I'm going to pull the belt tight and then I'm going to bend this basically in half. I'm basically bending this until these tips down here touch. And then I'm going to bring the, and I'm going to flex it a little bit farther than that as well. I want to over bend each of these ribs so they're not putting a lot of outward pressure on the hull. And then I'm going to basically just stick this down in the mortises. And we're bending it under the keel right now, but this keel is not fastened down firmly. It's just floating on top of these temporary blocks here, and it's just screwed into the stems, and the stems are just zip tied to the end of the gunnels here. So there's lots of flex that lets me put this in underneath. And the only really important thing to note here is you want to make sure that these ribs aren't pushing up on the keel, because if that's the case, that's going to start messing up the shape, which is why we have this keel here as a guide. So before I go on to the next rib, I'm just going to take a look at this, make sure it's not pushing on the keel. I'm going to come around to the end and I'm going to look at it from the end to make sure it looks symmetrical. And then we're going to go on to the next rib. And on the second one, I'm going to pull this out while I back it with the belt as well. Once again, I'm going to pull the belt tight and I'm going to bend this in half just like that until the tips touch and then I'm going to over bend it a little bit further and just relax a little bit. And then I'm going to start something that I always do on every skin on frame boat that I build which is flipping every other rib the opposite direction. And the reason this is so important is because no steam box is going to have a perfectly even temperature from end to end and so if you pull all the ribs out in the same direction and then you bend them all the same way and you put them in all the same way, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with a hull that looks very symmetrical, but then by the time you're done with your boat build, because those ribs had slightly uneven tension from side to side, the whole boat is going to end up lopsided. And so by flipping every rib the opposite direction while I'm building, even though that doesn't look as symmetrical at this stage, you're going to end up with a more symmetrical boat because of it. Okay. Once again, I'm only pushing this down far enough to where it's floating underneath the keel. I don't want there to be any upward pressure on the keel right now. And then as always, I'm going to come from the end and I'm going to check the symmetry. And then if I need to, I can come back to the rib and mess with it a little bit until it looks straight. And then I'm going to go on to the next rib. So every time I take a rib out, I'm putting a rib in so I can stay on top of my steaming interval. These ribs are feeling a little bit stiff right now and that's because I'm working a little faster than I planned so I need to just take a breath and slow down. However, a rib that is feeling stiff is more often a symptom of a rib that's been overcooked as opposed to a rib that's been undercooked. And so I tell my students before you assume that you need to steam for longer, pull out a rib that's a little bit earlier in the cycle and just give it a quick test bend and if that rib bends easier, that means that your ribs are in for too long and you either need to decrease the number of ribs in your steam box or you need to start steaming faster. So anyways, I'm going to put a rib in, I'm going to take a rib out, I'm going to use the belt on number three here as well, I'm going to pull it tight, I'm going to bend it in half like this. And then I'm going to over bend it a little bit farther and then I'm going to bring it over to the boat and I'm going to stick it into the mortises. And I'm really pleased with how these are bending right now. This wasn't the best quality bending stock so I'm glad that I'm not having any troubles. With this quality bending stock it wouldn't surprise me if I end up breaking a few ribs but you never know sometimes you get lucky. 
Okay, once again, I'm pushing this down over and over to make sure that it's not pushing up on the keel. And incidentally, that's what these intermediate height blocks are for, because if I'm letting these ribs push up on the keel too much, I'm gonna notice this start to rise up here, and I know that I need to put a little more work into keeping these ribs down so they're not changing the line of the keel. And I do expect a little bit of rise right here, and that is planned into the system. I just like to be able to keep it within the limits that I want so I can get the canoe shapes that I like to paddle. Now that I'm onto rib number four, I can get rid of the belt, and I can just start bending this by hand. So this technique is gonna be a little bit different for this rib. I'm gonna kind of bend this into a circle, just like this. I'm over bending it. It's really important that you're over bending these ribs. That way they're not putting a ton of outward pressure. And then I'm gonna bring this over. Just like before, I'm gonna flip it the opposite direction before I put it in. The nice thing about this system is that the shapes don't have to be perfect because once we wrap all the stringers around here, it's gonna even all of this out. So I'm not worried if the shape isn't exactly right. I just wanna see it look mostly symmetrical before I go on to the next rib. All right, so going on to rib number six, I'm gonna bend this into a circle. I'm gonna over bend it, and then I'm gonna flip it the opposite way because it's an even numbered rib. I'm gonna flex it down. This is sometimes intimidating to people if they haven't done this before, but the reality is that free bending wood is not that hard as long as you're working with good bending wood. Usually when people have problems with free bending, it's just because the wood that they're using is not a bendable species, or they're not bending it for the right amount of time, or it has bad grain, or it's been kiln dried. Moving on to rib number seven. So bending this into a circle, and then I'm gonna put it underneath the keel. I'm gonna force the middle down with one hand on either side. A Little bit of cracking noises, but I'm not too stressed out about that. Okay. And I bend it, I over bend it significantly in the middle. So when it pops back up, it's just barely touching the keel. And that's important because if you don't do that, slowly it's gonna push the whole keel up and then the canoe's not gonna be the right shape. So, over bending it a little bit, checking the symmetry from the end. Symmetry looks pretty good, but not perfect, so I'm gonna modify it a little bit. And then I'm gonna go on to the next rib. Rib number eight. Right around here, I'm gonna start changing my technique. Instead of bending this into a circle, I'm gonna bend this over my thumbs like this. I'm looking to really concentrate the bend toward the end of the rib in this area. And notice I'm not doing it all at once, I'm working it in slowly. And I like to see that end come a full 180 degrees back on itself. So that looks okay, I'm not doing that too much yet. I'm gonna flip this rib the opposite direction. And I'm just gonna keep using that same bending technique where I put my hands out here and I grab the bends and then I push down with my thumbs in the middle. Now I'm noticing that this rib is starting to push up the keel too much. So I still have a couple minutes where I can modify the shape of this rib. So while I'm holding this one down, I'm gonna hold the next one down as well and just give it a little bit more pressure to kind of keep it under the keel. Totally fine if the keel gets pushed up a little bit, you just don't want it to get pushed up a lot. And I could do the same thing with the one in front of it as well. For about two minutes, you can modify these even more. Okay. So I'm gonna to come to the end and I'm gonna check the symmetry. And the symmetry on this one is terrible, so I gotta push things around quite a bit. Double check the symmetry. Okay, that looks good. Time to go on to the next rib. Okay. Rib number nine. Pull the rib out. I'm gonna let it stick a little bit out of the ends of my hand, and then I'm gonna bend this over my thumbs, just like this. 
just working that bend in. I want to see that end come a full 180 degrees back on itself. And once you've done a few of these, you get a really good sensitivity for where, how far you can push this before the wood's actually going to break. So I'm going to put this in the mortises. And then same as every time, I'm just going to push this down using that same technique in the middle, really trying to force the middle down so it's not pushing up on the keel. And it is a little bit tricky in this area to get it down far enough, but as long as you have plenty of time to work between ribs, you should be able to hold this and just wait for it to harden up a little bit. And then when I see this come back up, I like to see this float up and just sit about a quarter of an inch beneath the keel because that means that as I'm doing my next rib, it'll probably keep rising up and it'll just be kissing the bottom of the keel. All right, going on to rib number 10. Same technique, I'm just bending this over my thumbs, working the bend in slowly, trying to get to where I can bend this all the way back 180 degrees on itself. And this is why it makes sense to spend the money for good bending wood. You might pay half as much money for crappy bending stock, but you're going to have 10 times as much frustration. It is worth almost whatever price you pay to purchase good bending wood. And really compared to any other type of boat building, this ends up not being that expensive. Okay, this was an even numbered rib, so I flipped it the opposite direction. Push it down. Oh. Okay, so here's a teachable moment. Come in on this. You see this split right here? This did not need to happen. I was paying attention to the camera and talking and not what I was doing. If I would have caught this split a few seconds ago, I could have actually pinned it down with my thumb. I could have kept bending this rib with my other hand. And as long as this split wasn't more than 25% of the way across the rib and 25% of the way through the thickness of the rib, I could have just come back with some glue later and put it in there and clamped it and it would have been fine. But because I wasn't watching what I was doing, I've got to split all the way through. So this rib is going to end up getting replaced at the end of the process. But we're just going to leave it where it is for now as a placeholder. And we're going to go on to the next rib. I'm going to put a rib in. I'm going to take a rib out. So that means each of these ribs now is cooking for about four and a half minutes, which seems to be working better for right now. Okay, this is rib number 13. Once again, I'm just going to bend this over my thumb. Looks good. Okay, let's put it in the boat. So I would say the most important thing about steam bending, whether you're steam bending around forms or whether you're steam bending by eye like I am, is just to stay relaxed. If you're nervous about this process and you're stressed out, chances are you're going to start to fumble, which is going to cost time and that's going to cause you to make mistakes. And then it's going to take you longer to get to your next rib. And the longer that rib cooks, the more likely it is to break. And the whole thing just starts to enter into this feedback loop of stress. And the way to not get into that loop in the first place is just to stay relaxed and expect this to be easy. I mean, I guess that's kind of the way life works, right? If you expect something is going to be a certain way, it's more likely to be that way. So if you expect this to be hard and frustrating, chances are you're going to get frustrated. If you expect it's going to be easy, chances are it's going to be. I'm going to go on to the next rib. So like I said earlier, you've got about 15 seconds where this is going to be really, really pliable and you want to maximize those seconds. And what I like to do is use about the first seven seconds coming out of the steam box to bend this. And then I like to put it into the boat and use the next seven seconds to kind of shape it in the boat itself. And I mean, I'm still going to have 30 seconds where I'm going to be able to work with this, but that first 15 seconds is really your golden 15 seconds. And so by dividing it in half, I kind of have the best of both worlds of being able to get it pre-shaped, but also having significant freedom to shape it while it's in the canoe. Okay, that looks good. I'm letting this flex up to where it's just barely touching the keel. 
I actually like it to be a little bit under the keel. Okay, that looks pretty good. All right, next rib. And for whatever reason, this is something I run into frequently while I'm steam bending, where the initial ribs will need to steam for longer. And I would say that that's because the steam box is slowly heating up and getting more and more saturated with heat. But that doesn't make any sense because I always let my steam box run for a half hour before I put my first rib in just to try to eliminate that possibility. But I've seen it for 20 years for whatever reason, about halfway through the process. Sometimes I have to shorten up my steaming time so the ribs will keep bending the same way. Okay, this is rib number 14. This is an even numbered rib, so I'm gonna flip it the opposite direction. Come out to the sides. I'm gonna push down in the middle. And like I said, if you pay attention, sometimes you can see if a rib is starting to crack. And if it is, you can pinch it with your thumb and keep shaping with the other hand as long as the crack is not more than 25% of the way across the rib or 25% of the way through the rib. Generally, I tell my students to have about 30% more ribs sitting at the ready. So if they do run into problems with their steaming process, they're not out of bending wood and they have plenty of wood to be able to replace any ribs that are problems. Okay, I'm gonna check the symmetry once again. It's looking good, more or less. Put a rib in, take a rib out, bend it over my thumbs, and I'm just gently working this bend in. I mean, it is a fairly extreme bend. You can see this is going all the way back on itself right now, but I'm not just cranking on it suddenly because that's how you end up breaking a rib. Okay, that looks good. Let's put it in the boat. Sometimes with bigger boats like this, this is a double, this is a tandem canoe. It's a little bit of a reach to get over the top of it to do this bending. So if you're a smaller person, it's a good idea to work on sawhorses that are a little bit lower. These sawhorses I think are 34 inches high. I'm not sure. But if I was a, a short person trying to bend a big canoe, I would probably lower these horses quite a bit. Okay, so I'm letting this slowly come back up and touch the keel. I'm looking at it from the end to make sure it's symmetrical. And I've been a little bit lazy about pushing these ribs down far enough because I've been talking to the camera. So my keel is actually floating above the center block right here. And so you can see that that's about a half inch. That's completely fine because I know from experience these ribs are gonna shrink and this is gonna be sitting like this within a couple of days. But what you need to avoid is this sitting up here like this, because if this is more than a half of an inch off right here, what is gonna end up happening is the bottom of your boat is gonna to be too round and then your canoe is gonna be tippy. So I talk about this in tons and tons of detail in my actual skin on frame canoe building course. It's just something I wanted to point out. Okay, so we are coming up to the middle of the boat right now, and this is as far as I'm gonna demonstrate this because the back of the boat's gonna be exactly the same, and I'm sure you guys are starting to get bored. Rib number 16 here. I'm seeing a little bit of bad grain on this corner, so I'm gonna be careful to make sure I don't accidentally split that out. Basically, anytime you've got the grain crossing the edge of the wood, that's more likely to split. So I'm just paying extra good attention. Okay, I'm gonna put this in the middle of the canoe. This is an even numbered rib, so I'm gonna flip it the opposite way. Stick it in there. And then, as soon as I'm done bending this rib, I'm gonna run into the other room and grab the kettle of boiling water that I have ready because my steam box is starting to run out of water and I don't want it to run dry and interrupt my steaming cycle. So, all right, 
That looks good. I'm actually pretty impressed. I've only broken one rib. This wasn't the best bending stock, so I'm glad this went well for the video. And once I get this done, I'll fire up the camera again. I'll talk to you guys a little bit more and hopefully you learn something. All right, so I just finished bending in the ribs. Um, I ended up replacing a couple of these because of some splits and some cracks. And then there was a few more that I wasn't completely happy with the shaping. So for those, I just pull them out of the boat, bring them over to the steamer, and then I've got a couple choices. I can either remove the dowels and put the entire rib in sideways and re-steam the whole rib, or I can just lift up the towel a little bit and put it over a section of the rib and steam it by hand for about two minutes pull it out, and then I can tweak that shape a little bit and put it back in the canoe. So even if you don't get this perfectly right on your first go, there's quite a bit of flexibility in the system to keep modifying it. And then as long as your rib lengths are actually the correct length, the stringers are gonna help to also pull this into symmetry even further. So overall, I would say that this was a pretty average bend. And if you're wondering about the results that my students get with this, Surprisingly, it's not that much different than what I do. I mean, I've been teaching this for about 20 years. I've had over a thousand students in person and about another thousand in my online courses. And I would say that as long as people are following the instructions and using good bending wood, breaking anywhere between one to four ribs is pretty much average. And if you're interested in actually seeing people's experiences with the system, if you go to our website and you click on the tab that says student builds, that's gonna take you to our student builds blog where our students from all over the world have documented their building process in exchange for a discount on their plans for their kayaks or canoes. Lots of great content there, lots of great examples of people actually interacting with the system. So anyways, this was sort of a more casual and relaxed version of the kind of teaching that I do in my skin on frame boat building courses. And if you're interested in checking those out, you can find that on our website, which is capefalconkayaks.com where we've got a whole bunch more skin on frame boat building courses, plan sets, and various free skin on frame resources. You can also find us on Instagram at Cape Falcon Builds where we post a daily build blog of everything we're working on here in the shop. And just like I say every time, even if you're not normally a social media person, think about checking out the Instagram feed because there's just so much more cool stuff there than I ever have time to put here on the YouTube channel. All right, so that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Make sure you click that like and subscribe button. I will see you next time.